It's been a few months since Scarlet and Violet have came out, and there's been a lot of different talk about them, whether they're good, whether they're bad. So I'm gonna check out a Candy Eevee video where she explores it a little bit more. Let's jump into it. Well, it's that time of year again. I've decided that this year I'm actually going to play through the game instead of spending 100 hours doing nothing but shiny hunting. <laughs> shiny pearl. For very obvious Scarlet and Violet spoilers, don't watch if you don't want to see them. Okay, you've had your warning. So what I look forward to the most every new generation are the new Pokemon designs and I can confirm there are plenty of babies in Gen 9. I love so many of the designs. I always find that when a new gen comes out I never know how to feel about the new Pokemon. What are these Digimon looking things? But then I look back at them a few minutes later and I'm like yeah that's my boy. <laughs> I think Sprigatito gets the best final evolution of the starters. I Facts. Completely agree with that. I think it got the best design overall. Uh, Skeledridge is like next there, and then I don't even know how to say um, Quaxley's final evolution, but that thing got that thing got stabbed in the back on its final design. It did not nail it. I adore that entire line. I don't care if it stands up, it's a cat. I was always going to like it. Quaxley's final evolution's looking nice. And Fue Coco. Fue Coco. I didn't really like Skeledurge at first. I yeah. think the way its colors look in game make it look like a clown, which I do not like. But yeah. now I'm seeing more of its official art and I'm slowly coming round. Like every time I look at him, he gets a little bit cooler. Mm. At this moment in time, my faves this gen in no particular order are Smoliv, Daxbun, Finizen and Palafin, Tatsugiri, Claude Sire, and Espathra. I regret to say that nothing is ever going to make me like the eyeliner Magneton. I mean, Sandy shocks. The Paldeo Pokemon. Uh, I'm in pretty much agreement with like her choice of like uh, some of the better Pokemon of uh, Scarlet and Violet, but uh, except for um, Tatsuguru, I think is how you say it. Um, I'm not really a big fan of that. It feels very uh, basic. I think when you can combine it with the um, what is it, Donzo, D Donazo. Um, when you combine it with that, that's a cool idea. But it alone, I don't find very cool. Slight editor note: It's pronounced Tatsugiri and Dondozo. Pokedex is kind of all over the place though. It feels like they couldn't really settle on one theme for this gen, so they were just like, mm -hmm. let's do five different things. Yeah. We've got evolutions for older Pokemon, one regional exclusive evolution, convergent Pokemon, ancient Pokemon, and future Pokemon. Yeah. It's a lot. I have to say, I think Scarlet gets the better deal for version exclusives. Look at Roaring Moon. Is yeah. this not the coolest thing you've ever seen? Enough said. I can't say that I had Popeye Goldfish legend. Yeah, I do agree, and I also think Slither Wings is also a really cool mon in general. Um, those are the main ones, though. I I think others are like okay, you know, Screamtail, um, Brute Bonnet. They're they're okay, you know, nothing crazy. Something I absolutely adore is the new Pokedex layout. Instead of just showing the models of the sprites, every single Pokemon has its own unique photo cover. This is such a cute idea that adds so much depth to each Pokedex entry. Just like how in Johto, Jasmine's Ampharos lights up the Glitter Lighthouse. Paldea's Pokedex cover for Ampharos has him at a lighthouse too. Him. And Drifloon is known for snatching small children away. So of course its Pokedex cover shows it trying to snatch a small child away. <laughs> There's also Swallow. I'm going to be vague and brief about the story because I don't want to give too many spoilers, even though I gave a spoiler warning. There are three different storyline paths that you can complete in Scarlet and Violet, and at the end they come together in a big finale that wraps everything up. This is mm -hmm. definitely one of the best games yet in terms of story direction. The finale was super gripping and had incredibly interesting character motivations. I find recent Pokemon games can be a bit hit or miss story-wise. It's mm -hmm. either something very predictable or, wait, are you telling me that this woman is so obsessed with this jellyfish space monster that she forced her child to cosplay it? And there's not much in between. Pokemon Scarlet and Violet story, amazing. Also stating the obvious, Nimona is the best rival character we've had for several games. Hold on real quick. I think they did a pretty good job on most of the story beats um, for... Scarlet and Violet. Um, I was a big fan of the Titan storyline. That was really cool. Team Star was okay. I didn't. I wasn't a crazy fan of it. It didn't really hit me personally. Um, and I'm a pretty big fan of the gym fights. But I don't know if you guys have seen that um, that picture going around where it's like how we think Game Freak wanted us to play Scarlet and Violet, which is just an easy circle around the region, and then how they wanted us to play, which is just everywhere just going back and forth because there was no clear direction and they didn't level scale the game, so. I do not take any alternate opinions on this. Also, I'm making a bet right now on when they're going to start selling Penny's bag on Pokemon Center. I give it six months, a year mm -hmm. at most. It's an Eevee bag. It'd sell out in 10 minutes. I'm 
not usually a fan of big open world games, but I tried to go into Scarlet and Violet with a positive outlook. I wasn't expecting to like Legends Arceus, but I ended up loving it, so I figured I should be open-minded with these games. Mm -hmm. I say it's an open world game, but in reality there is still a fairly linear path that you have to go down. There's no sort of level scaling, so there is still very much a recommended order that you should go yep. in. It's yep. like, yeah, you can challenge the gyms in any order you want. <laughs> but not that one, it'll mess you up. Yep. I love so many of the new towns and cities, there's clearly been a lot of research and love put into the designs. Alphanada has all these little mosaic pieces of the Gen 1 menu sprites and it looks so cool. I didn't know that fact. That is really cool. Um, I do agree, like, there seems to be a lot that was put into it, but it did seem like the towns weren't very well filled out. Like, a lot of them are just buildings you can't go in and just kind of there for show. And a lot of them are just filled at the same shops multiple times, like sandwich shops or, like, clothing shops are all pretty much the same everywhere around. And they didn't actually design like an inside for them. It's just like you walk in the door and, hey, what do you need? In a menu, uh, a menu immediately pops up. Or even just your bedroom. Something as simple as the little Pokemon stickers or the Hoppit planter. I am <laughs> simple. I like cute Pokemon art. It's the small, thoughtful touches like this that make me love exploring a new region. But as gorgeous as some of these locations are, there's not an awful lot of life in them. I yep. remember being yeah. 11 and seeing a trailer for Black and White. It showed the player walking around Castelia City and it just mm -hmm. looks so immense and exciting. Castelia yes. City isn't even that big by today's standards, but size doesn't matter. What makes the city feels so big is the amount of things there are to do. Yes. All of the different NPC interactions and buildings to explore. They yes. then built on this again with Yes, she's speaking on exactly what I was saying, where like in both those games, in Castelia City and um, Lumio City, like both of these cities, like almost every building you could go in and like talk to people and it'd fill out um, parts of the game or just have little one-liners that might not mean anything, but they still, like she said, add life to the city. I do think it's a little bit lacking in that, so this is a great point. I'm glad she was able to put it into words better than I could. The X and Y's Lumio City. There was so much to see there that they had to have a taxi service to help you around the city. And at first glance, this is what Mesa Goza looks like. It's a big shiny new city. I'm gonna really sink my teeth into it and explore. But then mm -hmm. you realize there isn't that depth that we're used to from Pokemon games. When you can't talk to 90% of the NPCs and even the ones you can talk to don't really have anything of note to say, it doesn't really feel as alive. And then yep. you find that you can't actually enter any of the buildings here. Yep. You can change your haircut buy clothes and food. There are several shops each for different types of clothes and food instead of just putting them all in one place, which I don't really understand. I can only assume it's like this to try and fill up the space because mm -hmm. this is how it is in every town. He ain't yeah. sneaky, I noticed. Yeah. But it's not like you can even go in these shops like before, they just shove a menu in your face yep, as soon exactly. as you open the door. It's very poor manners. You gotta let me sit down and order the free tap water first. <laughs> every single town is like this and it is a shame. I leave each town knowing as much about it as when I first entered it. I must yep. stress any disappointment I have here is from a place of love for the series. Mm -hmm. I want to know more about these places. I'm nosy. I want to barge into people's homes uninvited. <laughs> I thought the lack of towns in Legends Arceus would bother me, but it didn't. There was only one town, but it felt so alive. The NPCs all had their own names, which was a first for Pokemon. All of the different side quests have you talking to them and finding out more about the world. Mm -hmm. In Paldea, we get... Hmm. Pokemon. There are plenty of quality of life improvements I am incredibly thankful for. Best among these is the new breeding system. So there aren't daycares anymore. <laughs> You're the daycare. When you have a picnic, eggs can appear in your basket based on the Pokemon you have in your party. And the eggs appear based on how much time has passed as opposed to steps taken like in previous games. On its own, it can be really slow, but once you start making sandwiches that increase how often eggs appear, it's kind of amazing. I never like- Yeah, I'm, I'm kind of mid on that because the problem I have with it is you can't do anything else while that's happening. Like you just basically leave your switch for a, whatever period of time you want the eggs for. That was one of the best parts, in my opinion, about um, breeding with Pokemon Daycare is you could go and do other things in the region at the same time liked the grind of constantly riding back and forth to collect eggs, but since the eggs also stack here, I can just leave my switch for a few minutes, maybe go do some chores I've been putting off, come back and like magic there's 10 eggs in my basket. You guys have been busy! 
Also, hatching eggs is so much faster than it's ever been. True. If there's a game to shiny hunt with the Masuda method, it's this one. It was strange going through an entire game not having to do a single non-story trainer battle, because mm -hmm. they're optional now. It's weird, I remember when I was little, all I'd want to do in Pokemon Ruby was rematch all the trainers, but as the games went on, I'd skip past them more and more, so I didn't really miss it. With the new auto battle feature, you can earn experience without taking part in any actual battles, so I wasn't underleveled. I may have definitely decimated an entire ecosystem in my wake, but at least my Pokemon weren't underleveled. Yep. So all in all, there are lots of improvements, but it's frustrating when they take out quality of life improvements from prior games for seemingly no reason. Things mm -hmm. like in Legends Arceus, you could release multiple Pokemon at once. It was great! Not anymore! Another such change I noticed is that you can no longer rename Pokemon that are in your boxes. Like in Let's Go, you don't need to go to the name rater and you can just nickname them straight from your party, which is great. Brilliant! But while in Let's Go, Sword and Shield, and BDSP, you can also do this while they're in the box, in Scarlet and Violet you can't anymore. It doesn't sound like a big deal, but for me personally, when I have to give a thousand different Pokemon nicknames for an undisclosed video project that definitely doesn't involve surprise trades, having to manually move all of these Pokemon into your party to nickname them is pretty inconvenient. Character yeah. customization is simultaneously so much better, but also not. I always used to find that they never had the right shade of brown for my hair, but I'm eating good in Skull and Violet. They got me covered. There are more options to customize your basic appearance. Yeah, I can already tell exactly what she's going to talk about with the school uniforms only giving you four real options. And then sure, you can customize like your bag, your shoes, um, glasses, but in reality, that's about it. Um, she's really pointing out these like really great things that we did have in past games. Um, one of the biggest things I think about that I'm not sure if she'll touch on, but is really just the online system where it feels like we peaked in X and Y with the PSS, where you could see any nearby people who happen to also be on a network and ask them to trade or battle with you. I thought that was always fantastic. Parents than ever before, but that's about where it ends. You're stuck with four different uniform options that aren't the most appealing. They do have some options in terms of bag, shoes, or glasses, but it doesn't really do much to help and you just end up blending in with all of the NPCs that are wearing the exact same outfit as you. I don't yeah. need anything huge. Let's Go, for example, has a pretty small selection of clothes, but in my opinion, they're some of the best in the whole series. You've got themed outfits for all of the evolutions, Team Rocket outfits, it's cool! But to steal a tweet from my friend Patters, the vibe from this outfit is more like Pokemon get shoved in a locker version. Something I see a lot of people talking about is how shiny Pokemon are handled in this game. So like Legends Arceus, shinies now appear as shiny in the overworld, which is huge for shiny hunters, but there's a catch. Where is my sparkling sound? This is very important, I need my shiny Pokemon to make a little sparkle noise when I find it. In Legends Arceus, they make a sparkling sound so you know when you found a shiny. In Scarlet and Violet, it's silent, which means that you might run right past a shiny and not even know it. For the ones that don't have very noticeable differences, it's hard mode. It's not so bad for me because I'm a total shiny nerd and I know what they all look like. I actually wonder if there's gonna like, uh, someone's gonna create a mod for whenever a shiny Pokemon appears, it still makes that initial sound. I bet someone's gonna do that if they haven't already. But for most players, I imagine it can be quite disheartening. I've found several shinies that are extremely difficult to spot and I know that if I wasn't on my guard I probably would have just run straight past them. Other than this though, Scarlet and Violet are a shiny hunter's dream. Because there are Pokemon absolutely everywhere, you inevitably end up finding more shinies. I have 10 at the time of writing this script, none of which I've hunted for. I've been avoiding the great tusk in the room, but it would be disingenuous of me to not talk about the various performance issues this game has. I'm <laughs> sorry, but you knew it was coming. Yep. I usually avoid talking about this stuff because I'm just Lucy that likes to play her little Pokemon game. I know next to nothing about the intricacies of game development. I play Pokemon because I like Pokemon. If I cared about the finest quality trees, I'd play Tree Simulator, which is a real thing. So of course when- Tree Simulator is a real thing? I mean, actually what I would really equate it to is um, like the virtual aquariums that we can keep and like have fish and you feed them and they grow slowly. So actually, yeah, that sounds about right now. When prior to the game coming out, I saw people online getting upset about the graphics like they usually do. I didn't really care. But after having played the game, even I have questions. 
There's a big difference between a game not being what you want it to be graphically and having actual functionality issues at times, <laughs> which there are in Scarlet and Violet. I have had a lot of fun playing this game, like a lot. But with graphical bugs and various glitches being an almost universal thing for most players, there are things that you're gonna have to look past. When these things happen, I try not to let it spoil my experience. If anything, it adds to it. When I'm finding random Pokemon stuck indoors, Pokemon getting buried alive, or that one time a cutscene glitched and I walked through a character. It's not necessarily <laughs> for the right reasons, but I'm certainly having fun. Funny graphical glitches are one thing, but the truth is that this game does struggle with performance in a way I've never seen from Pokemon. I'm yeah. sure you all know about the frame rate issue, so I won't dwell on that too much, but there's more than that. Every Pokemon model in the box takes two seconds each to load. Even yeah. the menu sprites in boxes aren't loaded when you switch between boxes. Even to me, it is noticeable. I'm a Pokemon master, I don't have two seconds to spare. Yeah, this is one of those big things where they really need to decide with that next console what they're going to be doing with it and adjust accordingly. What would have been best is whenever they took the Switch um, OLED, and since they had already created a Switch Lite, um, just create a hard console for just home play would have been best for them, but that's not the direction they went, so we're, we're kind of hoping they'll follow up with that and maybe do something that is a little bit more home play and just kind of leave the Switch as more of a handheld console right now. So then we have like a little bit more performance to kind of back it up. I wonder how much it even matters to the average player though. I was talking about the new games with my older sister the other day. She likes Pokemon, but isn't quite as obsessively into it as I am. I asked her what she thought of all the bugs and performance issues and she was like, what? For some players, these issues don't matter at all and they're able to enjoy the game and have fun. But for some people, this might make them throw their Switch down and swear to never play Pokemon again. Yeah, um, so me personally, like, th the bugs, like, bothered me at times, um, but the biggest time it would bother me is whenever the game would just crash outright because there was something, like, not working right. And that can happen with any game, but at the same time, uh, we can clearly see it's because the time they needed was not fully put into the game before release so it, it was certainly an avoidable thing they could have taken a little bit more time for but because of the rush schedule that they work on it makes it very difficult I wouldn't go that far. But it is a little sad for me to see that this game would have benefited from more time in the development oven. It's beside yep. the point though. Scarlet and Violet have already had the most successful launch in Nintendo history, selling a combined 10 million copies. As a Pokemon fan, I'm ecstatic that my favorite series is doing so well, but also conflicted about the precedent it sets. The model for new releases are almost certainly going to be DLC based from here on out, and it yep. can be a bit disheartening knowing it's unlikely that Pokemon games are gonna have anywhere near as much post-game content as in past gens. To be fair, this has been a trend for quite some time in Pokemon. I remember I was sad when there was no Battle Frontier and Omega Ruby and Alpha Sapphire. <laughs> it's been eight years and I'm still not over it, but it's definitely gotten more noticeable as the games have gone on. A lot of the games I grew up on had these massive areas that you could only explore after the main game. Like the Johto games just straight up have another region. The closest we've gotten to this recently has been the Isle of Armor and Crown Tundra. Paid DLC. I just want a couple of extra towns and routes in the main game. Please throw me a bone. Even series staples are no longer series staples. Scarlet and Violet are the first games to not have some variant of a battle tower since it was introduced in Crystal. This is the first Pokemon game ever where you can't rebattle the Elite Four and Champion. It's hard not to oh. feel like going forward. Yeah, I didn't even know that because I haven't tried. I pretty much beat the main game, cleared the Pokedex, and <laughs> stopped playing at that point elements of the game that may have been included in a regular release could end up locked behind DLC. But then again, Pokemon have made many follow-up versions with extra content before, and I've always eaten that up very happily, so maybe I just need to get with the times. Again, I know next to nothing about release schedules and game development, but it was always a little odd to me that Game Freak were releasing two mainline games in the same year. I think they could have very easily released Arceus instead of Scarlet and Violet, or perhaps just released some kind of paid DLC for it like they did with Sword shield. Mm -hmm. Don't get me wrong, the free update was great, but I'm a Pokemon fan. They know full well I would have been willing to throw my money at them. Then there would have been an extra year before Gen 9 had to come out, and perhaps then we wouldn't be seeing some of what we're seeing now. 
Or maybe none of that was feasible and I'm talking total nonsense. Also a possibility. I know things are probably much more complicated than that. Pokemon is a mass media franchise with so many other kinds of media and merchandise releases to take into consideration. It is easy to go on Twitter and make a very angry tweet at the developers after seeing all of these performance issues. Please mm -hmm. don't do that. But there are clearly other factors at play on a management level here. So what's the takeaway? Well, I think it's okay to acknowledge that there are obviously issues, but I think it's also okay to enjoy the game in spite of them. At the end of the day, this generation gave me Smoliv, and I think that's <laughs> something to be happy about. Yeah, she, she did a really great job putting all of that into just really good words, scripting it out. Um, also, just me personally, I'm a... I remember what the name of the region is. Uh, oh, I'm a Paldean Whooper and uh, Claude Zire fan. That's definitely my favorite to come out of this uh, region so far. But... I really appreciated some of the insights she gave, just kind of pointing out some of the past games and some of the things that had reached their peak, but because of um, Pokemon always trying to innovate and make things better, sometimes they make things a little bit worse from that effort. Hopefully in the future we can see them um, look back and see where they could use more of their past qualities to improve a future game at some point. And then hopefully we'll also hear an announcement about maybe some DLC coming soon so we can add a little bit more to the game. I did not know you could not rebattle the Elite Four and the Champion in this game. That feels like a huge oversight for the first time ever taking that away. So I wonder if they're going to add that in DLC and make them like a little bit stronger for a rematch team. That'd be kind of cool. Uh, I'll link that original video with Candy Eevee in the description down below. If you did enjoy this video, though, feel free to go check out the last video I did where I reacted to uh, Pokemon's first horror film.